Awesome to welcome Bucknell head coach Trevor Woodruff to the basketball podcast. Through three seasons with Bucknell, Woodruff has compiled an outstanding 57-17 overall record, including a 40-10 mark against Patriot League opponents, and was named the Patriot League Coach of the Year in each of his first two seasons at Bucknell after leading the team to a pair of first-place regular season finishes. For his career, Woodruff owns 170-27 record coaching NCAA women's basketball and 329-162 overall NCAA basketball record when factoring in his 11 seasons as men's coach. Prior to Bucknell, Woodruff compiled 113-10 and 10 record and four conference championships over four years as head coach at the University of Scranton. Trevor, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Uh, had a chance to watch you present at Advance the Game Project uh, Clinic in Kingston, Pennsylvania, uh, run by Jonathan Bilbo and Darnell Ford. And uh, Coach, I left impressed, but I especially left with the fact that you have a defensive conviction, don't you? <laughs> I do, although I, I spend most of the offseason uh, talking and uh, diagramming offense. It seems like whenever we, we step into the gym to get the season started, my mind immediately goes to defense. So, yeah, I would say that's true. Now, unique experience, obviously, having coached both men and women at the collegiate level. So I'm curious, where did this defense mentality come for you or come to you? Great question. So I think I was always um, kind of one foot in on the defensive end initially in my career. I thought our teams always played really hard. Thought we had good intentions on defense. Um, but at one point, um, going back to my days at Misericordia University on the men's side, um, we were struggling. We went into uh, Christmas break, which at the Division three level is like two seasons. Like you work up to Christmas break, and then there's multiple week break, and then you come back and almost start all over. But it was at that time, I'm going to say it was probably – uh, 2011, uh, you know, we made a decision over that break that win, lose, or draw, we, we were going to, we were going to define success by how we played defensively. And so when our, when our players came back, we explained to them our vision that the expectation was going to change and that there wasn't going to be any easy way out. There wasn't going to be a secondary defense. There wasn't going to be, well, if this doesn't work, let's just go to a zone. We were going to be great man-to-man -man defense and at that point on from that point on I think uh, you know from 2012 the, the year after that right up into this past season 2022 I think we won in that 10-year span like eight regular season or conference tournament championships and the only thing that really changed was that we made a decision we were both feet in defensively it's great. And, uh, you know, let, let's start off with the uh, offense, because I love how you said this at the clinic is that we play offense to help our defense. So yeah. let's talk about that first. Well, I, I think, you know, I'm not I'm not I don't think uh, creating anything new here. I think your offense and your defense, you don't have to complement one another. Um, there may be some folks out there who are, you know, full court havoc style defense and also run kind of a slower paced, maybe Princeton style offense. I don't know of folks who do that. You know, generally, if you're an up, pay, up, up paced, uh, fast paced, aggressive defense, you're a very transition oriented offense. And trying to get your defense to create that offense by stealing the ball, trapping, deflections, really prioritizing the discomfort and uh, of the offense and turning them over. Um, we really look at it opposite. We say, okay, how can we play offense to make sure we meet our defensive goals? And so um, we really stress ball security, knowing that, you know, turnovers, pick sixes in football or live ball turnovers in basketball, those are, those are detrimental to your defense. You're not going to be able to guard those. Um, so we really prioritize pace of play, ball security, shot selection um, with our offense. Um, not that we play super slow. Um, last year, for example, you know, we were one, number one in our league on defense, and we were number three on offense You know, in terms of, of points scored. So we're not walking it up the floor. We're just very particular um, 
and almost, you know, relentless on our players about ball security and the shots that we take and when we take them in the shot clock, feeling like that allows us, if we're good at those things, we can get back defensively and set up and prevent, uh, pre present a full team defense, which gives us the best chance to have success. It's great stuff. And it strikes me as that if you were an offensive coach or you were a defensive coach, I mean, you're a basketball coach, but it, it wouldn't matter because what stands out to me is more of the mindset training. And that's what I feel, you know, even from that clinic of that 50 minutes I was with you, I got your mindset and I'm sure your players get that right away. And one of the things that I heard you say, and I used to do this and I haven't heard many people do it before, but I want you to explain why winners run. Well, again, everything I've, I talk about, I, I steal. Um, that was something I got to go through my mental Rolodex here, but I think that was something I heard um, from the, the head coach at Swarthmore on the men's side. Hmm. And he had mentioned that in a clinic that he gave and he really couched it as, you know, why, do, why do the, we have to, we have to spin or frame running differently. Like that's the reward. You know, you're lucky you won, you, you achieved. So as a reward, you get to go get better. You get to get in better shape. And that, that struck me. And so I stole it, you know, like so many of us do, you know, outside of Dean Smith and John Wooden, a handful of others, we're all just stealing. Yeah, it's great stuff. And, uh, you know, we used to frame it as saying that basically the winners are in the right to stay better. So why would we give out the extra work to the losers, right? Yep. I love it. Yeah, it's great stuff. And uh, the other part of uh, I love that your approach is, you know, yeah, there's some drills and there's some emphasis and different things like that. But what I found is that your drill, drills really mimic live play. And then they seem to be a continuation into your scrimmage. So can you talk about how you connect your drills to your game based play in practice? Yeah, great question. So I'm a teacher by training. Um, you know, I went through the education program at, at Misericordia University. And, I, you know, I'm a believer in whole part whole, like many of us. And so in my mind, we want to have buildup on a daily basis, right, from um, all of its detail, but from, from kind of the individual defensive perspective to small, small kind of, uh, you know, two and three man pieces of the defense and rotations, and then build that into ultimately our shell is kind of, um, the crescendo of our practice, so to speak, like we kind of build up to that and try to create the energy and then really demand and, and try to get our players to understand all the stuff we've done uh, is to build to this. OK, so, if you know, maybe we're working on, you know, almost every day we're working some type of closeout uh, because if your individual one on one defense is bad, your defense is bad. I think we start there. Um, and then build it into kind of small sided games. Um, but all of that stuff has to carry over. And so if we do anything really well as a coaching staff, I think what we do is um, we give the vision. I think we're really good. Our kids understand what it is supposed to look like. And then we hold them accountable to it right? And they can regurgitate the things that we believe are important. They have to know what shots we're okay with giving up. And then here are the, for us, it's five, for other coaches, it could be 10 or three. For us, it's, here are the five things. We call them constants that we have to excel out. And if we do, we'll accomplish our goal of giving up these shots knowing that, you, you know, at least for us, we're not going to take away everything. So talk to us about then, you mentioned that, uh, what shots are you okay giving up? And these, the constants are what you call non-negotiables, which, which I like that phrasing much better. So yeah. can you share those with us? Sure. Um, so to, to put it simply, non-paint twos, uh, actually contested non-paint twos are our are, are goal. So we construct our defense with that in mind. Um, you know, one of the things I, I, I think I've had, um, benefited from is because I love offense 
and I'm generally talking offense with, with fellow coaches in the off season. I think if you really understand offense and what makes offense good, that helps your defense. And conversely, if you really understand defense rotations, how teams are trying to take certain things away, I think it helps you as an offensive player. And so we keep, we keep that in mind, but yeah, our constants for us, I, I, I mean, I could tell you what they are if you want. I think the most important thing though, is can your players tell you what they are, you know? And so ours have them, you know, pasted in their lockers, you know, I might pass them on campus and say, Hey, what are the constant, you know, just, you know, it's, it's in jest, but also they know that they're expected to know it. Um, because if we have a mistake on defense, it generally goes back to one of those five constants. So for us, again, I'll get to the point, long-winded way to get to, um, we start with vision and voice. That's number one, you know, the idea of fighting for position to see ball and man at all times, right? If you have to turn your head, then you're not in the right spot. You got to fight for that, for that vision of both and then communicate, um, what you're seeing constantly, not negotiable. I heard uh, somebody mentioned to me, I think it was from the clinic where you and I met, uh, Izzy Metz from, from Wilkes mentioned that uh, uh, voice is a choice, I think is the way that, that he put it. That was his phrasing, yes. And man, is like, maybe I'm a weirdo, but that got me going. Like, I love that. I'm going to use that. Um, so that's number one for us. I, I feel like if, if you can't see it, then you can't speak it. And if you can't speak it, then you can't guard it. And so that's where we start, vision and voice. Um, then we talk about ball pressure. Uh, we're a pack line team. I think a lot of folks misunderstand pack line. Um, they take it as kind of a soft uh, defense where you're just kind of laying off people and trying to keep everything in front of you. I think the second part of that is true. You're trying to keep things in front of you. But it should not be, when played correctly, a soft defense. It's actually the opposite. Because you have so much help built in behind the ball when done correctly, you should be able to put um, extra additional pressure on the actual ball handler to help the interior of your defense. So ball pressure is uh, important for us. We talk a lot in our program. And this, this really just comes down to something that I, I have found to, to, to be beneficial. We are very big on taking away uh, the strong hand. Um, So that's a constant for us. We, in our closeouts, in our rotations, we are, we are constantly trying to teach and rep and learn. Let's make them beat us with their weak hand. And if they can beat us with their weak hand, then they're probably just better than us. All right. But I haven't, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, because uh, that was something I wanted you to bring out, because you, you mentioned that even in ball screen defense. So can you connect those two at the same time since you're talking about your weekend? Sure. So our primary way that we, we guard ball screens is, is, you know, typical term, we weak it, meaning we force it to the weekend. So the reason I like that first is that even good players in ball screens, yes, they're probably still pretty good with their left hand, but they're not as good specifically they're not as good at passing the ball to the weak side of the floor with their weak hand. You know, let's take, you know, most players are righties and they come off with their right hand and, and, you know, you give a lot of help from the weak side corner to maybe tag on the roller. And all of a sudden they throw a hook pass to that shooter's chin in the weak side corner and you can't get there. I found that if you're forcing them left, that's largely taken away. Because that same pass with the weak hand is very difficult. Um, so it may be a slightly off target or it's a little slower pass. And so everything's just a notch less, um, uh, I don't know what you want to ha- crisp, I think, with the, with, the, with the weak hand. So that's what we do. The, the second thing I like about it in the ball screens is it actually changes based on the side of the floor. So if, 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 again, we're playing a right-handed player and we're weaking the ball screen on one side of the floor, that's basically a drop coverage. Um, on the other side of the floor, it's an ice. 
right? So one side, they're using the screen, but they're going left. The other side, you're forcing them away from the screen, but they're going left. So it's consistent with your big player, but it changes the ball handler's view of it because the sometimes the screeners involved, sometimes they're not. So I like that part of it as well. Yeah, it's great stuff. And you, and you mentioned the passing piece. They're just not as effective going that way. Uh, vision and voice, ball pressure. Uh, what's the third constant? Third is, is, is the strong hand piece. Um, fourth, then we, we work hard on not fouling. I think we've been very good at that historically in our program. Um, you know, like a lot of folks, I remember Bo Ryan years and years ago harped on this. I, I, um, he would say their goal was to make more free throws than their opponents attempted. Um, so I think that's a, that's a good goal. And so that means what one you're getting fouled and two, you're not giving them away. So if we all agree that fouling generally negates hustle, um, let's be good at, at not fouling. And so we stress that that's one of the things we stat in our practice. We basically stat two things in particular in practice, things that we will then reemphasize with some type of conditioning after practice. One is turnovers, two are dumb fouls. Hmm. So we think it's that important. So, um, and so with the fouls coach, then who's calling fouls? Are we calling fouls and all? Because sometimes, again, if you call too many fouls, you remove aggression potentially as well. So talk to us about how you balance that. Yeah, that's a great point. And, I, I, and we've had that over over the years, you know, probably where we we call it too tight in practice. That's one of my complaints with officials is that we take it, you know, we take it to extreme. You tell us you can't put two hands on a dribbler, then we call everyone in practice. And in the game, you don't call it. We've just hurt our own team. <laughs> and so that's one of my biggest gripes is don't tell me something's automatically a foul if it's not because we're going to take it to the extreme. So, but I, that's that's why I quit reading the preseason briefs from the officials, but what they're going to call this year, because I found the same thing. If we adjust it and then they're not calling it, what was the point? (laughs) Right. So now we've, we've, we've hurt our own team. Yeah. Essentially we're getting hurt because the other team is allowed to, to do it. And we're not getting the benefit of doing it because we've trained them not to. So that's a different subject, but yeah, not fouling is fourth. Um, finding the balance is hard. It really is. It just comes down to feel, I think, um, continuing to have conversations about what it looks like. You have to make slight adjustments year to year. Um, and, and generally, as with most things, when we're older, we're better at not fouling. When we're younger, we foul all the time, which is what one of our issues so far this year, because we're a young team. Mm-hmm. Um, then the last of the constants for us is just, the, you know, the idea of one and done. Um, I think, um, you know, there's two parts to rebounding. I think there's blocking out and I think there's rebounding. Um, I know there's coaches all over the country that coach it different. You know, do you full block out? Do you tag? Do you just hit and go get is a term I, I, I've heard. Um, so we do a little bit of both. We really are try to be physical on blockouts inside the painted area. Um, and then on the perimeter, we're more of a tag and, and chase the ball down as opposed to try to turn and physically block out. But it's so important. I think for us, because of the mentality that we want to have, because of the culture that we're, tr- we fight to build every day, because of the identity that we want, I think physical blockouts is part of that because over time, you know, over a 40 minute game, at some point, one of the teams is just going to say, I've had enough. Like, and if, if they get hit legally, you know, like we don't want to play cheap or dirty, but if there's a physical contact every time their team shoots the ball, eventually they're looking for that contact instead of the rebound. And I think it has a, an, an accumulative effect over the course of the game, similar to in football where, you know, if you're running the ball up the middle, at the beginning, you might get two yards. But by the fourth quarter, it's six because the other team is just sick of the physicality at the point of contact. And so there's some football mentality in what we do. Uh, but giving them one and done is, is, is critical to how we play. Well, I love that. Thanks for sharing those constants and 
connecting it back constantly to mindset. And that's why I said, you're a mindset coach. And, uh, you know, every day you talked about, you fight for your mindset and two things that stood out. One was your phrasing, have to build up your calluses to be good on defense, which I love. And then the second one is the six pushups. So can you talk (laughs) about those two things that connect the mindset? Well, that came to the same, the same video I saw, uh, from Swarthmore with the, uh, winner's run mm, okay. um, so i would encourage everybody to get out and find that video his name uh Kamzalski, something like that had tremendous success so far came from davidson i think um, i would encourage everybody to get out and, and see that video it, it's it's really good um in terms of the mindset piece though i think you have to build it it's part of culture it's part of identity it's part of who you are and i really believe that's built um, in the beginning of your practice. All right. So, um, I always say I can judge, uh, a program's identity, who they are, what, what's important to them. What do they believe in by watching the first half hour, 45 minutes of their practice. Now, obviously the day before the game may look look different than the 30 practices in the preseason, but generally speaking for us, we start practice with rebounding. Every day, there's a rebounding drill. It's the same thing over and over, maybe presented a little bit differently. So today is a general, just basic rebounding. Tomorrow, maybe weak side rebounding. The day after that, maybe one-on-one. So we change up the drill, but it's the idea, we're going to start every day physical. And if you don't show up to practice with a physical mindset, with the idea, we're going to be here, compete, we're going to make some contact, um, you're going to have a a difficult start to your day in our practice. And so we really um, kind of section off our practice. The first 45 minutes to an hour early in the season, you know, we're not taking a jump shot, you know, unless you're on the offensive team in a defensive drill. Like we are really hyper-focused on defensive detail, identity, mentality. And I, I, I just don't know. I don't know that you can develop that over time if you're just sprinkling it in. I think it has to be who you are and what you do. Not that on a given day, you may not start with some skill development or let's get extra shots up, something like that. I get it. But I think over the course of time, your players will feel and and understand what you really believe in, not by what you say, but by what you do. And so that's the first thing about building mindset. Um, that I think about. And then the second thing, and uh, I really believe this, I, I, I stole this from um, a coach, Matt Woodley uh, has some videos out on, on pack line. I would recommend them to everybody. You know, I've watched them all, the, the Bennett's and Chris Mack, and, you know, I'm a junkie, just like all the other coaches out there. But Matt Woodley is terrific. And one of the things that he said in his presentation was, you have to be comfortable with conflict um, to coach physical good defense. And I think he's 100% right because a lot of players, probably most, um, will try to figure out a way to skirt around it if they can, right? If they can get away with not being physical, if they can get away with not jumping to the ball, not communicating, they'll try to. And so, it's going to require conflict from the head coach to stand pat, to stand firm and demand that we do those things all the time. Um, otherwise they will always take the easy route unless they're one of those special folks who know I'm only getting on the floor if I, if I defend. So those two things to me, back to your question about mindset, um, are really important. What's the beginning of your practice? What are you spending your time on and emphasizing? And, and two, are you a coach that's okay? Are you comfortable with conflict? Because you have to have it to get them to do what you want defensively. It's great stuff. Uh, Matt Woodley, just for those as reference, was on episode 30 of the podcast. Tremendous coach. Uh, and then Landry Kozmalski is the Swarthmore coach. And uh, you can go check out a bunch of his stuff as well. And uh, yeah, it's, it's awesome. And, you know, the other part that stood out um, is that you mentioned this in the clinic that sometimes your practice plan doesn't align with your players, right? Um, well, 
most days probably. Yeah. Um, you know, I think most players want to get in and shine up the skills and, you know, what's the neat, cool offense we're going to run. So from that perspective, I think it's, you know, it's a challenge, but again, I think you have to present it in our, in our, in my life, you know, we present it in recruiting, you know, so we don't want folks to walk in here thinking, you know, practices are going to be shoot arounds and we're going to scrimmage for an hour and 15 minutes and get out of here. Um, so hopefully we're attracting folks um, who want what we're offering in terms of how we practice, but that's a big part of any, any development is, is, is having players learn over time, how we practice. So again, you've won 86% of your games at the NCAA women's level, uh, you know, across platforms. So incredible success. And this style works for you. I'm curious if you put on your development hat for a youth player, because coaches are listening to this, thinking this is what I should be doing now. Your level is different than a youth level. Would you agree in terms of this mindset and philosophy? A hundred percent. And I actually, I'm reminded of that now that I have sons playing youth basketball um, here in Lewisburg. They've got great young coaches, but you know, they on occasion will ask, Hey, you want to come into practice? And I can't bring me to practice. Like I got to be somebody, somebody else. First of all, my kid will be furious with me, but you know, I, I think at that level, you know, we try to stay away from, Hey, let's have fun. Hopefully the work is fun. We have a certain amount of work to do at our level and, and hopefully you find it fun. But I think at that level, you know, if it's not fun, they're not going to keep doing it. And so you're hundred percent, right. I have two young, young kids, one's 11 um, and the other's um, six, just getting his toe wet in, in, in youth basketball. So I would agree with you. It's, it's totally different. Good. And I, I just wanted to bring it up. I have nine, 11 year old daughters. So I think I, you mentioned at the clinic that you had you, kids playing youth basketball and you know, that connection, I mean, it's everything that you're talking about in terms of mindset is, is what should be taught. That That's paramount, isn't it? Like it doesn't have to be a defensive mindset. It doesn't have to be an offensive mindset. It's an, a mindset of success and perseverance, right? I, I agree. I think as coaches, we sometimes I, I pre, I'm guilty as anybody else, um, especially when you're early in your career is you want to be all things, you want to do all things. Um, and then the reality is we get better as coaches once we we realize what equals winning and what creates losing and then develop a mindset around that. And so I got better at coaching in 2011 over Christmas break, when I, when I sat down, I said, okay, we're not going to just be a basketball team. We're going to be a defensive minded basketball team. And so then what that allows us to do when we really define um, what, what our culture is going to be, what our identity is going to be, is it allows you to, to, in some ways, put blinders on and say, this is where we're going and this is what it's going to take. This is what experience tells me, you know, and then you watch individual teams and, you know, it's not cookie cutter. It changes year to year, but we know what we want to look like at the end. And it allows us to put the blinders on and stay away from chasing shiny objects. Like I saw the Raptors do this. We should do this. Well, that's not what we're about. Right. And so I think it simplifies it for, for me as the, the leader of the program, for my assistant coaches who have to communicate and, and deliver the vision on a daily basis. And then for our players over time, it's very clear cut. If you ask our players what's important to your coach, they know the answer. And so they know the expectation as a result. Well, in the off season, I think you should go coach your sons and just focus on offense. How fun will that be? <laughs> Not for him. I'm telling you, he he barely likes me as a dad. He doesn't like me at all as a coach. Uh, well, maybe maybe you let him shoot it all the time. It'll be okay. But uh, I get it, um, Coach. Another thing that uh, that I loved, and I've seen it in different contexts, but I think you're all in on this. So I want you to talk about how you play the weak side differently. Um, you know, the, we, if people are visualizing, people call it the eye, we called it in and out. There's one player in and there's one player out. And particularly for you, the out player is playing a little bit differently. 
Yeah, so we really, once the ball gets foul line extended or below, um, on the weak side of the floor, we really try to play that whole weak side with one player. Okay, so um, essentially, let's say there's two players on the weak side, whether it's wing corner or slot corner, um, that defender who's playing the, the, the top offensive player is going to drop to a position where they can close out skip to either of those two. I think you see it a lot um, at higher levels. Um, I don't see it a lot in the women's game more, I think, as we, we're going along here. But essentially, we want to we want to overload that ball side, really give extra uh, stability and help to that ball side, try to play our five against the other team's three but knowing that top weak side defender is going to play that whole weak side. Now, to do that, you have to be comfortable um, switching, right? Because depending on who those people are over there, they, they're guarding the top player, but if they skip it to the corner, I now have the corner. If you're not comfortable with different matchups, you wouldn't want to play that way. You know, for us, we try to get players um, – I think it's pretty common these days who, who can switch, who are versatile. Um, so that's what we do on that weak side, give extra help from the bottom defender and play really play as a weak side zone with that weak side top defender and let them cover that whole weak side. And then our whole player, the extra helper, can just take whoever the ball doesn't go to. So it's a weak side X out. Uh, that player okay. covers two, covers the first pass. But you're also okay if they turn their position. And you almost said, like, butt to the sideline so they could see the skip and the ball. And yeah. I, can you talk a little bit about that? Because that was that was a real difference. Yeah, we'll, we'll ball watch a little bit on that. It goes against our concept of vision, you know, fighting for vision of both ball and man. Mm -hmm. But to me, that player's playing zone defense. You know, it's like the weak side player at Jim Beheim's 2-3. Like they're out there high and wide, just sitting on a skip because if if they skip the ball and, and get an open shot, as Coach Beheim would say, they're coming to sit next to me. That's their number one responsibility. So so yeah, we really do in that instance allow for more ball watching, with the idea that any cut to the ball side is going to be congested anyway because we have four defenders there, plus however many offensive players are there. You know, so if we miss on a cutter, maybe um, it's not as dangerous of an action because we have bodies there to absorb that cut. So the cutter gets absorbed ideally by like they, they get in the path of it. But do they pass it on to the end defender then? Yeah. So we would change their direction, you know, try to try to bump them and then absorb it generally with with that other defender, that other weak side defender. That's one of those points of emphasis, right? You're not allowed to bump cutters. And then, of course, yeah. you're bumping cutters. <laughs> well, <laughs> right. And that's the problem with flopping. It works. So now kids know, like, the only way I'm going to get this call is if I jump on the ground. So now that's what they do. <laughs> well, I love that, Coach. I really enjoyed that explanation. And uh, I'm curious, in the NBA, I've heard the term flood by bringing that weak side player over. Do you have a term for that in terms of how you communicate those two spots? Um, we don't, we don't have a specific term for that. That's just our base defense. Yeah. Like we we're always in flood. If that's the name for it, we're always in, in flood. We're always going to, um, provide extra help. Uh, certainly we don't want to overhelp, but we're going to be there initially to make sure everything's stable. Again, idea play five against their three. Generally, they may try to overload you and have four on that side, but most, most offenses these days, it's three on a side and two opposite in some form or fashion. Yeah. And for coaches listening at home, I mean, the other, the other strength of this is that you're forcing them to their weak hand. So those passes to attack that, uh, you know, that player that has two is are, are much more difficult in theory, if you cover the ball the way you want. In theory. Yeah. Always in theory. Um, talk a little bit too. You chase all screens, but you switch all curls. So that again, something that strikes me is just simplifies it for your players. Yeah. We have some teams in our league that are, that are, um, you know, really good. They run some five out stuff and everybody's moving. And, you know, we just, we like to chase because it eliminates, if we do it correctly, again, in theory, chasing on off ball screens um, eliminates the three point shot, right? Whereas if you're trying to shoot the middle, you know, on a, stag a stagger away, you shoot the middle, they can fade that thing and maybe get a clean three. Chasing should eliminate that. 
but it does make you susceptible to a curl. And so we've made the decision that we're okay with that. You know, we're okay switching that curl um, as long as we don't give up the three and then we're not going to give up a layup and we're not going to have two people chasing one of one of the two. We know the rule um, and we stick with it, you know, can pretty consistently. So you've mentioned this. I mean, you're, you're switching for advantage on the weak side in terms of those X outs. You're switching on curls again to eliminate or to create a solution. Are there other situations that you're OK switching? Late clock. Yeah. For sure. Um, late, late clock. Obviously, again, you have to be secure or, or comfortable with some bad matchups on the on the glass. You know, so, again, I think if you have if you have some core beliefs, Right. So for us, let's say, okay, I really believe switching late clock is beneficial. Okay. Well, then we know a weakness of that is rebounding. So now we have, we know in our, in our drill work and our, in the things that we emphasize, we have to really emphasize, you know, small on big blockouts, you know, getting two, two to the weak side, potentially if teams are bailing out, you know, sending their point guard back, whatever the case may be, if you have an idea of what you want to do, you then also know as a byproduct what will hurt you and you can prepare for it. I think that's the advantage of running a system. Um, again, I'll use Coach Beheim as an example. You know, he knows what hurts a two, three. So they can work every single day on the on the situations that are going to put them in jeopardy. Similar, we have base core concepts, and we know that teams who figure that out. And certainly the teams in your league are going to figure it out over time. Okay, can you now protect yourself from those vulnerabilities and still do the things that you believe in? I think if you have a system, it allows you to do that. Whereas, well, sometimes we're this, sometimes we're that. We're pretty pretty set in the system. Yeah, it's a very proactive solution-based system, isn't it? Yes, try to be. I mean, we are scout heavy. We're not opposed to, you know, a team is heavy lane line drive, or, you know, they, you know, dribble drive was so big for the handful of years there. And so, you know, we would make adjustments maybe against that team, get outside of our, our principles and say, listen, forget right hand, left hand, no lane line. Right. And so that was maybe a game time adjustment because we didn't want to get the lane line drive. Now our big has to help and we can't block out that weak side because the opposite bigs just sitting there ready to gobble up everything. Um, so we will make, uh, scout adjustments, but we are system-based and proactive knowing that because of the way we play, we're susceptible to X, Y, Z. So let's be good at, you know, adjusting when those things happen. Yeah. When I've used weekend defensive concepts, we've, we've changed it when there's been a high post again, Princeton being so popular, we would always force to the middle, to the high post. Cause obviously less space, right? That's another example of, you know, and once your players know your base system, it's not that hard to adjust, is it? No, uh, that that's a similar rule that we have. Anytime we see an offense, whether it's four high or four round one in the high post, um, the first rule, no baseline. So, so we kind of immediately changes our rule. All right, but that's not everybody. You know, no baseline. Um, so I agree with you. I think I think you have to be dead set in your ways. But common sense has to rule the day. <laughs> That's perfect. That's well said. Um, and, uh, you know, because some coaches, I, I, I still have clients at the Division One level that struggle with this kind of debate within their staff about, oh, well, we can't change our defense because then our players will get confused. Can you talk about that? Because I don't think they give players enough credit that they don't get confused if you approach it like you do with so much conviction and understanding that they know what you believe in. Yeah, I would, I would couch it as it, um, generally speaking, I agree with you, mm -hmm. depending on your team. Yeah. Okay. So for example, this year for us, it's probably the youngest team I've had in six or eight years. We're really, really struggling. Um, we're not very good right now. We're going to be, but we're not very good right now. And so for us, we really have to get good at guarding things one way before I'm comfortable um, changing or adjusting. Like right now we got one way to guard a ball screen and we don't do it right every time. So it's like, how many more can we give them? How many things do we want to be mediocre at as opposed to really good at one? Um, but, 
but generally speaking, I do think if you're sound in your core concepts, game adjustments, you know, uh, whether it's real time or pregame adjustments, you know, in your scouting report are a little bit easier, but they're always easier with experienced players, regardless of your system. It's just, you can't, they've seen it all, you know, they've guarded, they've hedged, they've, they've dropped, they've iced, they've, you name it. They, they, they've seen it all before the young folks. It's hard to tell what they've seen in some cases. It's, it's, it's a great point about uh, the different, obviously experience levels of the players and uh, John Becker, who's an incredible defensive coach at the university of Vermont with the men's program. I remember we talked about this too, about the challenges because your defense is so good in practice it doesn't do much for building the confidence of your offense. So can you talk a little bit about that reality as well? Uh, for us, it's definitely true. We're way ahead defensively mm-hmm. compared to the offense uh, basically every year because we've made the decision to be that way. Yep. Um, you know, it's a conscious decision. We know we're probably going to go into the first, you know, handful of games, probably maybe even the first, the non-league before we, the end of the non-league before we really start to gel and have confidence offensively. Other coaches may not be comfortable with that. Um, I, I have been, and, and we've had success, so we, we, we continue to do it. But, but yeah, I agree. I think anytime uh, your defensive-minded coach who's trying to install confidence offensively, it's a challenge uh, because you don't want to tell them to turn it down a little bit on defense because that's not who you are. Um, so it can be a challenge. One of the things for us is that we, uh, you know, at our level as comp- uh, compared to maybe high school level or, or certainly youth, you know, we can bring in male practice players. And so we're not necessarily playing against our defense all the time. Certainly in, in five on five scrimmaging, we are, but in a lot of our drill work, our concept work, our offensive breakdown stuff, you know, we have male practice players who don't necessarily know exactly what we're doing. Yeah, it's great stuff. And so I'm curious then back to kind of that original question that started this. When are you introducing variability in terms of your offense now having to play against different types of defensive concepts? Say that one more time. So back to that original point that we started this discussion, when do you introduce variability in terms of the different types of potential defensive coverages your offense might have to play against? Okay, so it's really a feel thing, right? Which, which to me, is is um, at its core, um, the a big part of coaching, right? It's not necessarily the plays. We all have plays we like that work and all that stuff, but it's the feel. Can you watch? Do you know your players and know when to take that next step? You know, if you're too late or if you're too early, you lose the the kids that are behind, and they fall further behind. If you're too late, now your older kids are sitting around bored to death, like, okay, yeah, I get it. We're going to weak the ball screen, but what other, what else are we going to do? So I do think there's a certain amount of um, feel to it. Um, to me, once I'm relatively secure in the fact that, okay, our core eight that, that are going to see the bulk of the minutes, you know, we may have a rotation of nine or 10 or 11, whatever, but if we have a core eight that are really, really locked into the basic foundational pieces, then I think it's time. You know, at a certain point, the kids that are struggling, they got to sink or swim, you know, and maybe you do extra work with them on the side and film and all that stuff. But at a certain point, once you get seven, eight, certainly nine, then I think it's time to now, you know, we're, we're away from defense 101. We're now in defense 201. You know, you're, you're not in that introductory class anymore. Well, thank you for sharing this, because, again, it seems to be a struggle for some coaches. And I think that lends some help to them to understand that, it, again, there's no magic to it. I mean, it's when do you feel they can handle it? Yeah, I mean, if it was just, OK, on day 36, do this, <laughs> you know, there'd be no difference between Mike Krzyzewski and me. And the truth is, there's a huge difference. between Mike. You know, he's really, really good. He's a he's the goat, in a, you know, in a lot of circles. So he has a feel that I'm trying to work and get better at. You've done pretty well so far. So um, another thing, I love how you phrase this about transition defense. Basically, 
as a coach, you control what it looks like. So look in the mirror if you're giving up transition baskets, because it's probably a choice that you've made with your what you're doing in transition defense, right? Yeah, and that came directly from Dick Bennett. Dick Bennett yeah. said that clearly. He said um, transition defense is the responsibility of the, of the head coach. Um, if you're getting beat in transition, then it's your fault because you have total control over how many players you put back. And if you have them all back or they're supposed to be back and they're not, you have complete control over keeping them in the game. And so he said that. It, it resonated with me, and I've used it ever since. Um, transition defense is the responsibility of the head coach, so I take it as a responsibility. Yeah, that's great, and it simplifies it again as well in terms of you make a decision about what's going to happen. And uh, another thing that uh, I really enjoyed watching your presentation is your emphasis on recovering, and I don't know if you use this phrasing, but recovering to help and not to your check, which, again, is such a fundamental of defense, isn't it? Well, it certainly is in, in the pack line. You know, I think if you're if you're the type of, of defensive team who's maybe um, on the line, up the line, denial type, you know, then you're recovering more so to the man. Even though you're up the line a little bit, you have to, you know, you got to get to your man, know where they are so you can deny them actively. For us, you know, the core component of what we're trying to do is really – it's, it's not me guarding mine, it's us guarding them. And so we're more concerned with all five of us being in a position to defend the ball while knowing where our man is than we are of protecting against what's going to happen next. We're stopping that ball. We're plugging the gap first. So if, you know, if, you know, the ball's on the left wing and they've got wing top wing, and they pass it back to the top, and the weak side defender runs out to the wing, well, that gap is wide open. We've just defeated the whole purpose of the pack line. And so our concept, again, stolen, is, is just we want one movement in our, in our uh, closeout, and that is not help and recover, just recover. And so our help is essentially our starting position. We start in help. And now when the ball comes at us, hopefully we've slowed them down. Hopefully they're going left. And now we can recover on airtime to our man. But, but yeah, playing the ball when it's not your man is critical in pack line. Yeah, great insight. And you mentioned closeouts a few times. So, And I know some coaches, when they force weak hand or think about it, they get bogged down in the closeout. So I'm curious your phrasing, your philosophy on this. Are they forcing weak hand as they run towards or are they shifting after they've closed out. So if you try to shift after you close out your beat, I don't think you can do it against skilled offensive players. So we try to, it's a little bit uh, in the weeds, but we try to close out square, meaning, you know, we're, we're, our shoulders are square to them, but we shade the strong hand. So essentially if you can, you know, if, if, if I was coming at you and you're on offense, I'm going to be, shaded to your right shoulder still square still knowing you have a half a step head start going left but you're going left and then so we go what we say is we're two and then we go to one and we always want our uh the shooting hand up so if we have a right-handed shooter we want our right hand up uh because that that kind of naturally the 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 way the body moves if you put your right hand up it's going to pull your right side up and, and so now if we're outside, we feel like we have that head start going to the strong hand. Whereas if our left hand's up, then our left foot's up, your first movement to your strong hand, I got a drop step and I'm slower. Mm, okay. That's kind of... We'll I, I like how you phrased it. Works. Yeah, I like how you phrase it because, I, I mean, I, I like that. I mean, for sure, that's what I believe too. And we've and I'm not sure if you have a specific terminology before, it, but we always said that, say, if you're forcing weak hand to, to someone's left hand, then their right foot would be able to kick the offensive player between their legs as basically that positioning, right? That's kind of the visual for coaches that are listening. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, we want to have our left foot below their right foot. So yeah. their right foot should be somewhere, you know, in our middle. Exactly right. And does that shift or change if you're forcing baseline, say, on that uh, where they're driving left hand to the baseline? 
Um, or you're still doing that that shift, or you kind of exaggerating it more. We're more so there's one section of the floor where we're in conflict, mm. right? Um, our our attempt to force weak, and the defensive concept of no baseline. It's that area of the floor. The offense is left foul line extended or below. Mm. We're in conflict. Are we taking away their right hand? Because then the baseline is open. Or are we taking away the baseline and now they have an advantage to the so for us we we shade to the base with their foul line extended below especially um we try to play the baseline and and heavy help at the ball side elbow that's that's our answer to it we know it's a, we know it's a problem we know it's a glitch in the system so to speak um but that's what that's what we do because of the way that we play the low post um, you know, if we're allowing easy baseline bounce passes into the post, then it becomes very difficult to have efficient interior defense. And again, we don't want to give up clean, uncontested baseline drive. So it kind of, you know, it forces us to, as, as you said earlier, go against our principles. Um, but we do it. That's what we try to do. You found the solution and that's great. <laughs> no, I appreciate, I mean, I appreciate you sharing that because again, that's, that's it. I mean, it's about solutions. Even if you play a system, there's still these unique kind of variables or solutions that come out. And uh, I, I got to ask about recruiting a little bit, just in the sense that recruiting to this system, not in terms of the type, but how do you evaluate a player that would want to play in this type of system and succeed? Because generally, again, we watch games and we see offensive talent. And are you watching for defensive talent? I do think oftentimes defensive talent uh, pops mm. if, if you're looking for it. Because so few folks um, are doing it willingly, right? Um, so if there's someone out there who's intentionally playing really hard, focused, aggressive, tough, disciplined defense, they kind of stick out. Um, you know, whereas – you know, an elite offensive player sticks out in most games as well. So does an elite defensive player. Um, the way I think the best way to do it is just to really um, present it in recruiting. Like this is what we value. This is what we believe in. And if, if this isn't something that you can sign up for, you should not. Right. Because I'm okay with conflict. Right. So you could kind of go back to the things that we've talked to about before. Like we had a extremely talented freshman last year who was as good a shooter as I've ever coached. She didn't break into the starting lineup until I think seven games left in the season. It wasn't until um, I felt secure that she was committed to defense that we made that move. And it really changed our year. You know, we went from being a pretty decent team to a team that could win the championship in our league because we added a six foot or six one lefty that could stroke the three and give length to our defense. But I was willing to keep her coming off the bench until I thought she was completely bought in. So again, back to your question, very specific in recruiting, what the expectation is going to be, what our culture is, what our belief is, what we think leads to winning. And then I think folks who are, who are attracted to that will, will come and folks who are not won't. Have we lost recruits over it? Probably. Probably. You know, when I tell them, listen, the first 45 minutes to an hour of most practices at the beginning of the year are going to be defense. There's some kids who may, I may have lost them in that moment. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but you've got to find you that out lose beforehand. Them. And you want to lose them, right? Because if they don't fit you, that doesn't waste your time and it doesn't waste their time. And then, uh, you know, that 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 piece that goes with it, just that offensive question there becomes, can you, or in your mind, it's someone who wants to come play for you, who may not be the best defender, but maybe has some offensive talent. Do you feel you can develop them into a elite level defensive player? I do. I've seen it. As long as they're committed to it, um, and I've said it before on this, I'll, I'll say it again. I say it to a player, listen, you're not good at defense right now, but you're going to be. And so it's just a matter of them being committed to it, understanding it's, it's going to be important to their, uh, the amount of minutes that they get to play. Listen, I'm not dumb. If, well, some people may disagree, but if somebody can make a basket in a situation and, and help us win games, they're going to play. 
right? So offense is very, very important. And if you had one skill in basketball, I would say that's probably the most important one, right? You got to be able to put the ball in the basket, make a shot. But do you want to, do you want to be, um, are you, are, do you want to be involved or you want to be committed, right? There's a difference. You can be involved on our team. You can be involved in the game, but are you committed to the winning process that requires both feet in at the defensive end? Well, I love it. Thank you for your answer. Because again, I, I do come back to a little bit of the development piece for people that are listening, high school, youth level coaches is that, look, if if they have a passion for the game, especially to develop offense and to be able to train and work on their game, then coaches at the elite level feel like we can develop them into defensive players, right? Well, I would agree. I think, you know, when we recruit, we're looking for, for great offensive players with, of course. with defensive uh, kind of characteristics, meaning do they have size, do they have length, do they have mobility, and are they, and they, you know, then they have to decide, okay, am I going to buy into the, to the concept? But, you know, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to give a $300,000 scholarship to somebody that can't put the ball in the basket, you know? So we're out there hunting offense as well. I think it's easier to develop defense than it is to, to, build somebody into scoring when for 18 years of their life, they haven't been able to. And then all of a sudden you're going to make them a score. I don't, I don't know that that's realistic. Can you make them better? Sure. Can you make them a score score? I don't know. I don't know that that's true. I love that coach. Thank you for sharing that insight. Cause I, I totally agree with you in that respect. And I think that connects back to how, again, development kind of works for players and what you can do with them when you get to this level, tell us a little bit about uh, coaching at Bucknell and how that experience has been jumping from division three to division one. Yeah. I appreciate the question. Thanks. Um, you know, I'm really fortunate. I've, I've had an opportunity to coach at multiple places all of which um, cared about success of the basketball teams, both on the men, men's and the, and the women's side. Um, Bucknell, uh, I think, is a unique place. Um, it's a place that I truly believe you can have it all. You don't have to pick between uh, elite ac academics and, you know, top 40, 50 level basketball. I think we can provide both when we do our job correctly. Um, so you don't have to pick one or the other. Um, and so it's been great for my family and I, you know, um, I grew up on a dirt road in Bradford County, Pennsylvania, uh, about as far away from elite academic university as you could get. And now my sons run around campus like they own the place. And so I'm, you know, I've been gifted with a lot of, a lot of great things in life and being here at Bucknell is one of them. And so I just look forward to continuing to build on the success that's been going on here for, for quite a while. And I uh, appreciate you having me to talk a little bit about it. Well, I loved it. I enjoyed this conversation. I enjoyed your conversation at the clinic and uh, you'll have a ton of coaches now that uh, maybe haven't heard enough about you or enough about Bucknell that will uh, follow you and connect with you. So it's going to be a lot of fun coach. Well, hopefully they have good high school players that they want to send. <laughs> Always the priority. I get it. Let's go. Thanks coach. Thank you.